you know, what interests me about hobbies and obsessions and interests is that they often emerge through contact with other people. And for me, bird watching came about through uh, contact with a good, good friend. And it was 1997. And a friend and I had decided to go to India. And it was my first time in India, but my friend had already been there a few times before. And we'd planned, you know, the whole trip out and I was going to head there for six months. So I was very careful about what I wanted to carry with me in the rucksack. I didn't want to have all of this extra weight. And my friend, Chris, we were living in London at the time. And he said, Julian, don't forget, get yourself a pair of binoculars. And I said to Chris, you know, I'd, I'd had no real interest in bird watching, but he was a good friend. And I trust him. I said, but, you know, why? What, what, for what reason? You know, I don't want to have extra weight. You know, I'm going for a long time. He said, just trust me, get a pair of binoculars. So I went out and I got a pretty cheap, uh, smallish pair. And the two of us traveled to India. And after a couple of days in Delhi, we caught the train down to Agra, which is where the Taj Mahal is. But instead of going to the Taj Mahal, my friend Chris suggested that we jump on another train about 40 or 50 kilometers west of the Taj Mahal to go to a national park called Keoladeo National Park. And over two or three days there, my kind of world changed, my life sort of changed. You know, we started exploring these extraordinary grasslands and wetlands, and there were eagles and harriers flying right past us, and there was these great flotillas of duck, the ducks that rose off the silvery lake. And the guide that we'd hired, he was pointing out baby owls and these little holes high up in the tree. And then we came upon these two great Cyrus cranes, which are these extraordinary birds that stand about two meters tall. And they have this wonderful uh, scarlet coloring in the feathers all around their neck and their head, like they've been sort of dipped and crowned in crimson. And the two, these two birds, remember, almost two meters tall, they start dancing around one another in the wind, in the mist. And I just thought, wow, this is amazing. So this, you know, his, his encouragement of getting a pair of binoculars just opened up this whole other world, this whole other world of life and other forms of life and existences. And I was just bowled over. I just thought, wow, this is phenomenally beautiful. Birds are just extraordinary. So that was kind of the start of it. So did you transpose that back to the UK when you came back? Yes. And the, the, the funny part about that is that my wife, Julia, we, we weren't married at the time. In fact, we'd, we'd only met a week before I traveled to India. Uh, she came over and joined me in India for a few weeks. And we traveled through South India together. And, you know, there were all these extraordinary, exotic, colorful Indian birds, barbets and racket-tailed drongos and hornbills, you know, really, really stunning and very, very easy to see. And we, we kind of fell in love with one another and with birds while we were in Southern India. And we, we came back to North London. And I know I think the first weekend back, so why don't, why don't we go bird watching? It was, it was early March and it was cold and it was wet and it was dreary. And we got on a train and we went up to Hertfordshire to an RSPB reserve. And it was still cold and wet and dreary and it was late winter. And there was very, very little movement in the landscape at all, except for a couple of almost indecipherable brown blurs of birds in some thickets. And it was then we realized that, you know, it's not just the easy parts of bird watching because it's really about paying close attention. It's about kind of developing a, a way of looking at the world that is what is at its heart. So although the kind of love of bird watching began in India, it really has continued ever since in all kinds of places throughout the world, including London itself, um, really through paying, paying close attention. So that was the story of it, all because of, because of a friend who said, you know, go out and get, get a pair of these. <laughs> and, you know, these are, very, these, these are still my daily working binoculars and they're inexpensive and light. So they're really portable. Mm -hmm. so, so what, what birds in the UK did you get fascinated by? I mean, obviously, I've, I've seen a hornbill and it's pretty mind blowing. It's a, a yeah. psychedelic explosion. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. To England, the, more, the more kind of brown and gray birds, but again, yeah. in the end, they become as fascinating, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you, 
in somewhere like the UK, you've got that whole range. You've got extraordinarily colorful, vibrant, and very easy to see birds like puffins on the coast, for example. Um, and you've got the wonderful and haunting call of the cur curlew, you know, up on the moors. Um, but you've also got these extraordinary small brown birds as well. Uh, and, you know, one of the birds that I hear here a great deal, um, but in, in, in Britain, where it's right on the edge of the range, you know, there's the nightingale. And as a musician, you probably have some kind of respect for the nightingale because it's got this phenomenal tonal archive that it can a kind of, um, it's a sort of archive of, uh, archive of of best hits that it can sort of dip into at any time it wants. It's constantly changing the melody, the structure, the volume, everything about it. And yet you look at it and it's a very nondescript brown small bird. It's got a little bit of that lovely, lovely sort of rusty red on its tail, but otherwise it's the color of old leaves, you know. And yet what its capacity for song is just mind blowing. Mm -hmm. What about, what about um, kind of the uglier end of birds, like crows? Love them. Absolutely love them. And I think, you know, what, obviously there are species that have, you know, long been kind of seen as nuisance uh, birds, you know, whether it's for, because of their damaged agricultural crops or whatever it might be. But, you know, crows, ravens, they're all in the same family, phenomenally intelligent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I constant, we've got a lot of walnut trees here in the valleys of Northern Greece where I live. And the, the hooded crows here, they'll gather walnuts, but they're too hard to really crack the shell easily. So they'll fly to electricity lines running along the side of the road. They'll wait until they see a car coming. They'll drop the walnut on the road in the hope that the car will run over it. If it doesn't, and I've watched this countless times, the crow will drop down to the road collect its walnut, fly back up to the electricity line and wait for another passing bird, a uh, passing car, sorry. And yeah. it, inevitably, eventually, a car will hit that walnut and then it drops down and eats the, the fresh nut on the inside of the hard shell. So absolutely amazing ability, you know, these birds. Yeah, it's amazing that uh, cognitive thinking, you know, solving yeah, yeah. the problem. Yeah. I read somewhere that the crow is, is one of the few animals that watches humans, not, not because it's scared of us and not because it's um, wary of us, but because they're fascinated by what we're doing. Yeah. They kind of go yeah. human watching when we go bird yeah. watching. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think that's one of the things that I love about bird watching. You know, come, coming back to this, all this is is carefully calibrated pieces of glass. You know, that's, that's all the, a pair of binoculars uh, are. But the, the magic, I think, the magic of magnification is that it allows you entrance to another world. So you could think of microscopes, for example, and how they enable you to see things that are actually invisible to the naked human eye. They're so, so small. Or astronomical telescopes that allow you to see the craters of the moon so defined and so clearly. Mm. Same with binoculars. You know, they allow you to enter the lives of birds, you know, that are often shy or would startle away quite easily. And it encourages a kind of intimacy with them. You know, you can see not only that vibrant hue and color on the feathers, but also watch the behavior, learn to, you know, learn to see how they behave and what they do and how their lives are arranged. And for some people, of course, it might simply just to, to be to enjoy the beautiful and extraordinary elegance of a bird in flight, you know, and I love that kind of the democracy of wonder, you know, we can all approach birds in any, any kind of way we, way we want, because ultimately bird watching is just a term or a label for looking closely at the world around us. And it could be, if you choose otherwise, it could be wildflowers, it could be amphibians, it could be whales, it could be mammals, you know, anything else, or all of those, whatever you're interested in, you know, by looking closely, by using binoculars, whatever it might be, allows you to find your way into those lives. Yeah. Well, you live in one of the um, one of the, the prime bird watching areas of Europe, and it's like you know, there's places like the Estonian wetlands, probably yeah. even in the Pyrenees, whatever. But the lake where you live is nearby, and and I talk about yeah. one of the lakes near you, Lake Orange, is one of the main 
uh, bird places in the whole of Europe, isn't it? I mean, so what specifically does it have there that gives it this status? Well, there's three connected lakes, you know, literally just down the valley from where I live in northern Greece. And I live above the two Prespa lakes, you know, which are both in northern Greece, but they're also shared by Albania and North Macedonia. And I mean, it's a really, you know, it's, it's not Greece of the imagination with those high mountains. We've got a lot of snow right now. It was minus 10 or 12 degrees Celsius overnight last night. And there are bears and wolves in the woods. And it's, you know, these great, great big high beach forests in the mountains. And on the lakes, what these lakes are particularly renowned for in terms of bird life is it hosts the world's largest colony of Dalmatian pelicans. Mm. There are about 1,400 pairs of them, alongside about 600 uh, great white pelicans that nest together on the lesser Prespa Lake. And the great white, uh, sorry, the Dalmatian pelicans are just arriving back now, beginning to, to breed, even though it's bitterly cold. Uh, but come spring, when both species are back, the air above the lakes are abs is absolutely full of these extraordinary, archaic, ancient-looking birds that just circle high and high and high and higher than they can in order to, to travel. And they cross the mountains with ease. They use the thermals that rise up off the land to kind of effortlessly spiral them higher into the atmosphere. And then they glide down. And then once they reach almost the land again, they circle, they find or locate another thermal and rise back up again. So that's that's the, the species, the two species that the area is most renowned for. But the wetlands are absolutely full of water birds from um, night herons and squawk herons to great white egrets. You know, it's really teeming. We've got the wonderful bearded reedling, which is a species that's prevalent in reed beds in, in the UK as well. Um, so there's a lot going on here, you know, and, and all kinds of raptor species as well, like the short-toed eagle or the snake eagle, as it's called here locally. So quite, quite diverse, obviously, but also very, very different from the UK. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of crossover species. And, you know, when we moved here 20 years ago, we left North London and we, we moved to the small village uh, in the mountains above the Prespa Lakes. And when we'd left London, we were, we were struggling with life there. You know, we were struggling with our jobs there. We were struggling with a whole range and host of things going on and wanted to kind of leave in order to find a different path for ourselves. But coming back to birds and bird watching, one of the things that I discovered as soon as we moved here was that I was finding great tits and blue tits and chaffinches and green finches uh, and starlings and blackbirds here in these wild, vast meadows and up in the hills and in these great, uh, beautiful oak forests. I was finding those species of birds in landscapes far, far wilder than the North London that I knew and had lived in for a long time. But it was in North London that I'd first come to know those species. And it, it began to occur to me that for many of the commoner species in our world, they have found an admirable ability to kind of um, bridge those divides. We often talk as humans about the rural and the urban, the countryside and the city. And while Julia and I were struggling with the city and wanted to find somewhere in the countryside, for a lot of these birds, they've managed to span that divide. They've kind of found an inner equilibrium in some respect. And I realized that they were kind of more at home in the world than we are quite often as people. And so they, you know, by watching these birds, common birds, they encouraged a greater um, sense of trying to ground myself in place wherever I happen to be. And, you know, in my bird watching, I've, you know, had some extraordinary, very privileged experiences throughout the world with remarkable species. Um, but it's still those same common birds that I have a deep abiding fondness and affection for. The great tits that will be on the bird feeder out back of the house right now. There's something about the common species around us that shows us there's still something intact in the world. And as a good Greek ornithologist friend of mine said a couple of years ago to me, he said, we need to not take the common species for granted. Otherwise, the common species will become the rare species. Mm -hmm. So I think it's about really looking at it, it 
in all of those different species as a kind of totality. That's been happening in our lifetime, hasn't it? There's, there's birds that were common in my youth, which it, now, if Absolutely. I see a thrush now, it looks like the most exotic. Of course, yeah. it is exotic, but yeah. you see them all the time. And now you go, wow, I've not seen one yeah. for a year. Or starlings are a lot rarer, aren't they? And Unbelievably rare. And I know that, you know, you've, you've written about starling murmurations and and I have as well. And we have, a, I know we've got a shared fondness mm. for them. And you're at the Blackpool Pier and... Yeah. And I was down on the down on the um, Brighton Pier when I was writing about them, and you know, starlings have suffered an extraordinary loss right across right across Europe. I mean, between 1980 and 2012, we lost 40 million starlings wow. from the skies of the European Union, um, which works out to a scarcely believable 3,400 a day, or about 140 every single hour for that 32. Uh, years, consecutive years that we have data from. But there are still sufficient starlings to produce those remarkable, extraordinary murmurations, whether at Blackpool, whether at off Brighton Pier. And they are remarkable on so many levels, not only what the birds do and the fact that we've now understood that, that starlings are only in contact inside a murmuration with their seven nearest neighbors that's it yeah. so those those great swirling fainting movements they're really down to individual birds knowing only their closest closest neighbor mm. that's it and yet this whole great incandescent mass of birds shifts as one mm. and i love and i you've probably experienced this yourself in, in blackpool but certainly on Brighton Pier, one, I, one of the things I dearly loved about observing murmurations when I was writing about them was how they bring so many people into the fold. People that don't necessarily have a kind of daily connection to the natural world, but happen to be there. You know, and I was watching how teenage girls were, you know, had been taking selfies in front of the amusement arcade, suddenly spun around and turned their phones in order to to film these starlings and these old couples and these younger folks on their way to the pub, everybody stopped mm. in order to watch this murmuration, this great weaving mass of birds that shape shift in the air right in front of your very eyes. So there's extraordinary potency and power and beauty about this phenomenon that sadly we are slowly losing, we're losing hold of because so much biodiversity is diminishing around us. Did you go under the pier when they all roost? I, what I did is I got down on my hands and knees and pressed my ear against the boards of the pier. And I could see them through the little gaps and that wonderful chittering where they've all settled to roost for the night just rose right up like a sort of earworm. Yeah. Um, you know, it was just, it was absolutely extraordinary. You know, and they just vanished within seconds. They They all kind of, peel out from the sky it seems and then lose themselves inside the uh the, the kind of the, the the wooden boards of the pier itself on the struts yeah i like the contrast between the grace and the beauty of the murmuration and the, the mad claustrophobic shrieking madness of underneath the pier <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah exactly and i wonder whether they're they're vocal like that in flight yeah. I don't actually know. It's just now that you've mentioned it, I'm I'm just wondering. Yeah, um, you know, silent, don't they, murmurations? But they do. Because we're quite a long way away from them, so we might not be. Yeah, to... precisely. Yeah. I was just wondering, wonder whether they're in contact through vocalizations, but I don't know. I'll, I'll I'll have to, you know, I'll have to look into that. There's so many of the great, you know, it's a little bit like migration. We we've learned. A great deal about bird migration the fact that they can somehow sense the earth's magnetic field they can use the stars as a compass they can they can um uh, orientate themselves according to where the sun sets and rises they recognize landmarks but we we're really only touching the very surface you know as the great American nature writer Annie Dillard wrote, you know, our life is a faint tracing on the surface of mystery. And I often think of that when I think about these, this ability for, let's say, a swallow that right now will be swirling around the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa. In another six or so weeks, it'll start journeying north. And 
will cross an entire continent, will cross the Mediterranean Sea, and will find its way back to the very same nest that it raised young in last year in a village like mine in Northern Greece. And that fidelity to home and place and the precision of their journeys is, I just find absolutely extraordinary, really. It is, it's, it is stunning. And so to think something of that size can travel that far. Yeah, 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 that in itself. And I, I mean, I brought you something here. This is, I'm pretty certain that this is a tree sparrow nest. Wow, that's beautiful. So yeah. small, so delicate, and it's it's largely made up from hairs from goat and sheep. My neighbor has some animals, and it's been kitted out on the inside with some lichens and little bits of leaves. Mm. And it's as you can see, it's it's only that big. Now, that's a tree sparrow nest. I'm pretty certain it's a tree sparrow nest. But right now, because I mentioned that we've got quite a lot of snow and it's extraordinarily cold here. Outside our front door, we have a long abandoned swallow's nest that is just a little bit bigger than the nest I showed you. But instead of hair, it's made of mud. And we moved into this house about six or seven years ago. And that swallow's nest was there, but it hadn't been used. I don't know when it was last used. But for the last three years, on especially cold nights, when the temperature drops to around about minus 10 Celsius, Wrens, which is one of Europe's smallest birds, very common species in the UK. In fact, I think it's Britain's most common bird, um, but also an extraordinarily territorial and solitary bird. You rarely see them together. Mm -hmm. They convene from across our valley and they roost together in that swallow's nest that is above our door downstairs. So last night we were watching them all arrive and there are it's hard to get a head count because there's so much movement. But last night, as we slept in our bed, there were about 15 wrens in the old swallow's nest that's tucked up above our door. And they, they seek shelter from these cold temperatures and they crowd in together. And so what I do is uh, on a, a number of mornings, I get up while it's still dark and I find a spot in the garden and it's freezing out there. And I watch them, I count them out in the mornings. And they emerge from the nest one by one, like little parachutists. And, you know, sometimes one will even, you know, is really keen to get going and will push and elbow the other one out of the way if birds had elbows, which they don't really. Uh, and so they all drop out and start the day. And then at exactly 10 to 6 in the evening, late afternoon, as it's just starting to get dark, they've spent their days spread apart in the valley. They all start arriving to the front of our house. And they, they, they all... Um, swirl upwards and uh, whisk themselves up into that little abandoned swallow's nest. So a nest that's just a little bit bigger than that holds about 15 or 16 wrens every night at the moment. Another thing I've always found fascinating with birds is, in a sense, it's, it's almost like a portal into the dinosaurs because now, now they're, they're pretty sure that the dinosaurs eventually became birds or whatever. Yeah. Sometimes in my head, when I'm when I'm when I'm looking at often it's when I'm looking at Canadian geese by a canal because you get about 20 of them and they're big and they sort of look like dinosaurs. You can sort of yeah. transpose it all backwards. Obviously, you know, they had nests, they had eggs, they had all these things. I always seem like behaviors now inherent in birds that can almost make us understand dinosaurs back to front. Yeah, I mean, I you know, there that linkage is very, very strong. And because I live in a place that has a lot of pelicans, I I I don't know a single species that, for me at least, uh, is more redolent of the dinosaurs than watching these great beings in the air. You know, these extraordinary lens spans, those elongated bills. There's something so of the dinosaurs about them. Mm -hmm. And there was a few years ago, there were some uh, pelican fossils uh, found in France and they were dated back 30 million years. And what was most astonishing about it was how little in 30 million years, how little today's pelicans, which there are several species in different parts of the world, how today's pelicans had barely changed at all from that ancient ancestor from 30 million years ago. Nearly everything about the fossil finds 
were almost the same as what we see today. So it's a species who literally, that literally, sorry, has a strong connection, you know, into deep time, really. I guess uh, once you've discovered flight, you've almost perfected a model for life, haven't you? There's not a couple of tweaks, but you've got the big one there, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I'm always fascinated by, you know, the human kind of um, seeking after flight, how we've long been, you know, you go back to the Wright brothers and this whole fascination of flight. And, you know, that must have come way, way, way back whenever it arose from observing birds and from desiring to share a kind of um, a different medium in many ways, you know, where we're, we're, we're bound to the earth, you know, through gravity itself. There is, other than being able to jump up or, you know, climb a tree perhaps, even though you're still tethered to the earth, you know, there's no way to be free form in the sky uh, until, you know, the development of, of, of aircraft. And, um, and yet, you know, you look about you and you watch the swallows when they come back in spring and how they effortlessly glide under the eaves and our attempts at flight are so awkward in comparison <laughs> yeah. you know, to, to, to the natural aviators of the world, which are all of those other species, you know. I mean, there are some birds that aren't great flyers, but there are birds like the swift, for example, that is just, you know, beyond comparison. It's peerless and it's... Oh, one of the greatest birds. Well, then that, the other side of the swift coin is that when it's on the ground, it's as clumsy... Yeah. I mean, you have to pick them up and throw them up in the air, otherwise... Yeah, nice. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and what, what, what passes for its legs is really just these two small, stumpy extensions, <laughs> you know? It, it really... And that's it. It's built for the air. And what it's... The cost of that, of course, is it can't. Once it's, once it's grounded, it struggles, and it struggles mm. badly. I like but that. to see them in the air is to see another... Oh, it's amazing. You know, to see something else. When they sleep, they, have, they switch off half the brain and keep it yeah. open so they can fly and sleep at the same time what a trick <laughs> yeah absolutely and you know we're still unraveling so many of these tricks you know they're you know and i think this is what you know i i brought you know because the, the the beauty of birds as well of course is that you get all these great books you know you've got the guides to the birds of indonesia or you know the birds of the indian subcontinent and, you know, like all good books, these are books that are just full of countless stories, you know, and stories that have the ability to, to connect us to these remarkable lives. And they're, they're a little bit, you know, I see these field guides, they're a little bit like those choose your own adventure books that I certainly read in North America where I grew up when I was a kid. You know, you, you turn pages according to where you wanted the story to go and you can flick through these field guides. Um, go in search of specific species if you want, or you can leave it up to chance and just go out and see what you see. You can come home and flip through the book. So you get to kind of, um, you know, you get to choose where you want that path of yours to go. But inside it, you know, I think of, if you're in California, let's say, you've got a species called the acorn woodpecker, which is a very small, really beautiful woodpecker with a red cap. And it's called the acorn woodpecker because it drills out holes of different sizes in dead trees. And then it harvests acorns and it slots them into a hole that is the perfect fit. And they're called granary trees. And they use these for periods of time when there's little food availability about. But that's not the best part about the acorn woodpecker. Not only has it learned to store all its food and make little slots and holes, and it looks like this great grid work, you know, hundreds of holes all together. Um, but as each acorn slowly shrinks because it's in sunlight, or whatever it might be, the acorn woodpecker then removes it from the slot and transfers it to a more appropriately sized hole, thereby freeing up the larger hole so it can restock. So it's literally shifting its food around. And you know, there's species across the world, of course, you know, have all of these remarkable, wondrous um, 
fantastical abilities that we're really only scratching the surface of, of kind of understanding. Some of them are quite obvious. You know, you can watch the acorn woodpecker do this, but some of them like research regarding the swift, you know, and turning half of its brain off or about the murmuration and its seven nearest neighbors, the starling's seven nearest neighbors. A lot of that's brand new research. You know, we're, we're literally just unlocking some of those secrets. And I'm absolutely certain that there's still far more out there of the mystery than that which we've come to understand so far. Yeah, that, I mean, they're far from when I was a kid to now, they've realized that birds and like most animals are far smarter and far yeah. more aware than they used to assume. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, it, this way, this rational thinking of moving the acorns into small holes, I mean, that's not instinctive behaviour. That's actually flying around thinking, oh, I better go back to the tree and move the acorns around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And because of that, they spend an inordinate amount of time. You know, I see it as this kind of grand artwork, you know, painstakingly moving um, acorns from hole to hole in order to find the perfect slots in order to also create additional space you know it's a magnificent project i think so how much does your fascination with bird watching feed back into your books quite a lot you know it's it's i mean i've got an enormous fascination with all of the natural world bird birds were my first love but you know i love looking closely at wildflowers mammals um you know pretty much everything you know recent years i've been looking more closely at butterflies and trying to get a greater understanding of them um but a lot of it still comes back to birds and i think that's you know I, i've learned an enormous amount not only about them but from them and i think you know there are stories of whether it's about migration their fidelity to place that kind of topophilia you know coming back year after year there's so much to be gleaned um from observing closely and from trying to create a, a kind of um, space in which we um, absorb more of the, 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 the non-human world. You know, I think that increasingly we, we're in the midst of all kinds of crises, not only the COVID-19 pandemic, but of course the biodiversity, biodiversity crisis, um, the sixth extinction of, of species across, across the planet and climate change itself. Um, I think one way through these great challenges is to encourage a greater degree of kinship between species, between ourselves and the more than human world. And, you know, I look at species like the wrens finding a way, despite their isolationist tendencies, when they're, you know, at, at non-cold periods of the, of the year, that they are finding ways to work together to avert a potential killing crisis, which is the cold. Mm -hmm. And in that, I see an extraordinary metaphor for what we are currently facing it when it comes to the great environmental crises of the planet. That we tend to live, you know, individualistic lives within a system, a capitalist economic system that encourages individual behavior and thinking. And yet we really need to find ways of locating the collective and the communal amidst that if we're to challenge many of these issues. And so this wondrous but very localized phenomenon of wrens gathering every evening in winter in that nest, to me tells a far greater story than just their own, um, something can be taken from it. That's how I kind of see it. And I see that throughout a great deal of the natural world. There are sort of those fierce emblems in the wild aren't just the wild, but they're also teachers in a way. And, you know, I think there are communities uh, across the planet, particularly of indigenous peoples who've long known that, you know, they, they exist in relationship with wild species because they're part of a shared world. And I think we, many of our gravest crises are caused by um, a belief that we don't live in a shared world by through separation or a, a desire to separate ourselves out has, has often been cataclysmic.